Welcome to Lacrosse Now alongside Travis Eldridge. I am Tom Ashton. Thank you so much for joining us. This the last show, the last Lacrosse Now of 2021. Hard to believe that we've made it to another year. I would say it'd be sad, but there's a lot of things in 2021 <laughs> that I'm not sad you to see You want to leave goes. some things behind. It was supposed to be like a boost, and we kind of got kind of similar to 2020 with some a whole college lacrosse season. So that was a plus. And on that positive note, <laughs> let's uh, talk about what's on today's show. We're going to yeah. actually look at back at 2021. The good things, the glass half full, of course. We'll have our favorite moments, the overlooked moments, a bold prediction for 2022 that maybe we think could happen as well. So that's uh, we look forward to that at least today. Yeah, we also have some terrific guests. Of course, we've got the Beast, Greg Gurenlian, getting ready for LaxCon coming up in, in a couple of weeks. He talks about that and face-offs and a lot more and Tampa Bay Buccaneers long snapper former college lacrosse player Zach Triner is on the show we talked Tom Brady his Madden rating mm -hmm. winning a <laughs> Super Bowl ring all of that you don't want to miss that interview so make sure you stay tuned yeah absolutely it's a big face-off show if you like face-offs this is yeah. a place for you but um, <laughs> meanwhile let's uh, get to our first topic how about that yeah. um, our favorite moment of 2021 Travis you have the floor so for and me, lacrosse, that yeah, is. for me, I, overall, we had talked about this around Thanksgiving and overall, for me, one of the great things of, about 2021 was the return of college lacrosse yeah. and getting a chance to crown a champion. So I'm going to put that aside because I didn't want to be generic. And so I'm going to go And some of it was the appreciation of the college game and what we had missed in 2020. I'm going with Thursday night lacrosse mm. from the ACC. I mean, it was the gift that kept on giving all season long. The yeah. games that we got on Thursday nights from this conference were absurd. You had that Duke comeback against Notre Dame, the, the Pat Kavanaugh yeah. shoe game where Duke comes back, ties it up. It was like 12-7, 12-8. Yeah, like they, they, they come all the come way back. Yeah. back. They tie it up. They ended up winning it in overtime. That was amazing. You've got Duke's dramatic win against Syracuse. Talk about comebacks. Forgot Syracuse was down 13-8 to in that game. Came back, actually took the lead, 14-13. Duke scores the final two goals. And then, of course, it was um, the, the Adler, Mike Adler save right at yeah. the end yeah. to preserve the, the win. That was awesome. How about North Carolina's early win against Virginia? That was like the Chris Gray, hey, I'm here coming out party for 2021 helped uh, propel him to make his way to a tour ton final this year. <laughs> Ironically, a wake up call for Virginia too. Yes. I remember and, Lars <laughs> Tiffany had, had, told, had told us that at one point. He said, yeah, that North Carolina game really woke us up. Yeah, because they came out firing. Like yeah. North Carolina, it ended up being, I think, a 16-13 game, but it never really was that close. No, yeah. Like, yep. It was one of those kind of games. And then, of course, Duke, North Carolina, one of the great rivalries in all of college sports going to overtime and living up to the hype. But really, that was a really good defensive battle. Maybe not what we expected going in with how good those offenses were, but a defensive battle ends up in overtime. So ACC Thursday night lacrosse, just like because these teams would play on Saturdays and the games wouldn't be nearly as good, but there was something about the spotlight on Thursday night and Twitter was just awesome. Like everybody appreciating kind of what I think is the best of the best in college lacrosse. Like that was the sport at its most exciting level being put on display on a national stage. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up regular season games because I think a lot of times those get lost in the yeah. shuffle with championship weekend and the, and the NCAA tournament. And often those games on Thursday night, you could put them right up there with a Final Four game, a championship game. And you have to enjoy it just as, as much because it is at the best the competition ha is. Yes. You know what I mean? I know the stakes are higher later on in the year, but the stakes are pretty high then too. So I'm glad you brought up those games that maybe we forgot about um, after championship weekend and, and whatever. And you know what? It puts the sport on a display like it's like not the stakes don't have to be that high for you to get this incredibly entertaining product we got yeah. it obviously championship weekend and i didn't want to go with the cliche of uh, i mean that the end of the championship game was awesome yeah. and a terrific moment everybody knew but that. yeah all season long those games just delivered yeah absolutely so i'm gonna go with something off the field Ooh, for my favorite okay. moment and i just it was it, everything that happened at Syracuse after the season was over. Of course, the Syracuse men had a rough year. There was a lot going on there. It, yeah, it was the not end of it both on and off the good. field. It was ugly for the most part. Yeah. And then, you know, after the season, it, it was obviously time, you know, John Desco deciding himself to step down and move away and move on from the program. And he had such a great legacy there and he'll go on um, and will be remembered for a long, long time. But, 
you, everything that sort of came together with both coaching staffs on the men and the women's side to have Gary Gate go over to the Syracuse men to me I thought that was really cool and, and sort of get that feel that's going to be we're going to see here in 2022 and, and see what it's like to see him on the men's sideline after what a legacy he left in that women's program and then not only that but then you have Kayla Trainer going into the women's side of yeah. things, uh, coming over from Boston College, and remember how great she was as a player and still is at Team USA level <laughs> yeah. um, and the professional level too. But at Syracuse and and what she did there, the impact she made, and now she's going to do that as a coach, which she is so highly regarded there. And she goes back to Syracuse, and then Gary Gate brings in Dave Petromala. I mean, and from the conversations we have with Petro over the last couple of years since that 2020 year, in which um, he decided to step down after that and. And, uh, move on after the pandemic ended everything and you could tell from talking to him he wanted to get back into things and this seemed like I mean what a what a transition back into coaching again <laughs> at full time at, at the collegiate level this you know it, yeah it, it's a pretty big deal because we had talked about it before like well what is the, you know the, what's Petro going to do you come from Johns Hopkins what is the what, where are you going to go back and well there just aren't a lot of jobs right. that are of that level right so you you get back and he's going to be at Syracuse now for we don't know how long but something he's now in a great position when something opens up I'd imagine Petro's going to be back, and oh, yeah. his sons are going to be playing collegiately wherever that you know wherever he lands and playing you know for them whatever it could be. Yeah. I think it's going to be it's really cool. Just the way that whole thing came together at Syracuse is really really neat, and, and I, I really appreciate sort of how it all fell into place and what it's going to look like on both sidelines for the men and women in 2022. I mean, think about how incredible this is for Syracuse lacrosse. On the women's side, you bring in. Probably the best player in the program's history in Kayla Trainer to lead the team. And in the process, then with that, because that she comes in and Gary Gates switches over to the men, and now you have maybe the best player in Syracuse men's <laughs> yeah. lacrosse history leading that program. I mean, I don't know if like this fell into place perfectly. How where else do you have the like the face of each one of those programs? ending up leading each one of those programs at the same school. It just doesn't happen. No, and the way it did happen, I think, was done in a nice, classy way. Yeah. And I, I, we'll see how they do. I don't know how they're going to do, but I just like the way it happened. I thought that was really cool um, to see it all come together for one of the, the Blue Bloods in the cross. By the way, it's a look ahead to a couple of topics from now. What type of, uh, what type of thing happened here in 2021 that could be defined like something five, six years yeah. down the road? Like, this could... For both the men's and women's programs at Syracuse, depending on how things work out, this could really set the stage for what is either a great incline of both one of these programs or staying the same. We don't know, but it could be something we look back to and go, 2021, that those both those moves ended up paying off big time that, for the York. That's when the chips and the dominoes all fell into place. Yeah. Really neat. Um, okay, so from our favorite moment to the overlooked moment or performance in 2021. See, I'm going to go, and maybe some of this is a little biased because we here at LSN have the rights to do games for the CAA, and we have a chance to do the CAA conference tournament. But Drexel, to me, both the men's and women's side, I thought got a little overlooked. There was some national talk here and there, like, oh, Drexel's showing up here in the CAA. But like, going into the year, this is a Drexel team. I'm going to talk specifically on the men's side. It's a Drexel team that, like, in, in years past has been good, but – like they're competitive in the CAA. They're usually not a team that gets over the hump. And usually they'll build up some maybe early season boost, but then they lose a game that they're not supposed to. Mm. And we'd even talked – I was talking to Reed Bowering about this, a guy who had been there for five years when it, during the season. I'm like, man, what's different about this team? Because it, And I, I said it. And he's like, yeah, you know what? You're right. Like we knew it. it kind of going in as a, as a team, there are times that we just – and we didn't get it done. And for whatever reason, they got it done this year. And not only did they win a CAA championship for the first time in a while, but they get to the NCAA tournament. And, like, I think it gets forgotten about because Notre Dame then went on to give Maryland one heck of a game yeah. in the quarterfinals. But that game between Drexel and Notre Dame in the, in, the, uh, in the opening round of the NCAA tournament was tied at eight with under two minutes to go. Yeah. Notre Dame That's had to score right. two goals, it scored a goal with a minute 19 seconds left to take the lead, and then they got one more at the end when Drexel was trying to kind of last-ditch yeah. effort. But that was a game, and very easily could have gone Drexel's way if 
I mean, they had a, Notre Dame had a couple of great saves. Ross Blumenthal had an incredible game for the Dragons in that one. Once again, kind of got overlooked by then later in the day, Loyola has the great upset over Denver at the same location. Yeah. So I think like all that kind of got overlooked. Drexel was a couple of minutes away from playing Maryland in the quarterfinals of the NCAA tournament, which would have been an incredible run for this Dragons program. Yeah, and I think that's so important for the sport of lacrosse to get a, a different face, you know, yeah. th- th- in there and competing and and giving these these teams that are there on a yearly basis a battle, you know, and, and making their name known through that and giving some more legitimacy to conferences like the CAA and saying, hey, you know, we, we don't play soft lacrosse here. We're, we're playing tough lacrosse. We're playing good lacrosse and can compete with anybody in the nation. Well, and I think it shows you, too, like, I think people knew Ta- know Towson as a program. They've been to the Final Four in recent memory. And you obviously people know UMass and, and their history and how good th- that program has been over the course of its time. But I think having somebody like a Drexel who, you know, people, they kind of go in and out. If Maybe this is what can get them to that plateau. And if you all of a sudden have... Delaware playing at the level they are with Ben DeLuca. And then you've got UMass and Greg Canelli. You know what you're going to get from them. Towson and Sean Natalin. You know what you're going to get from them. All of a sudden, you've got a conference. That is a dogfight. You're talking about multiple top 20 teams. Conference tournament time is huge. Maybe you start finding a way to be more like the Patriot League, where you have, you're in the conversation for multiple bids. You look at Towson's non-conference schedule coming up. Like, they're... They win a couple of these, they're going to have a chance to be in that conversation because of who they play out of conference. So I, it just, to me, Drexel's emergence, and now they have a lot coming back. And on the women's side, too, first NCAA tournament program history. Yeah. To me, some of that maybe got overlooked by some of the other stuff going on. But don't forget, Dragons were like this close from playing Maryland in the quarterfinals. Yeah, and, I, and like you said, made a statement as a program, both the men and the women's side. So yeah. that's not about the lacrosse are playing out there outside of Philly. All what right. you got? I'm going D3 life. You know, mm, got to represent my like people it. out here. RIT <laughs> beating Salisbury in double overtime that to game win their first NCAA tournament. If you don't remember <laughs> what happened in this game, the finish was just sensational. Yeah. Uh, down 14, 13, I believe it was, with 11 seconds, 12 seconds to yeah. go. Quinn Commandment ties the game. What a name! 14, by the way. 14 at that point, and then they go on to win it in overtime. Ryan Barnable at his 13th goal this season. So the guy that didn't score a lot in double overtime. Yeah, they win the NCAA title for the first time in program history. We talk about great games, and that was a great game with an outstanding finish. And then you feel like those heroes are going to live on in that program. For so that's a legacy defining moment oh, yeah. for, for a kid, for a team, and for your, someone's life. You, you know what I mean? Like, you're always going to remember that. And then when the recruits come walking in, there's going to be pictures on the walls. There's going to be talks about people talk about those kind of things for years to come. And I feel like, of course, it happened at the Division Three level, so it wasn't at the, the headline of everything over the course of um, the final couple weeks of the year. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's just as amazing of a game and performance as you could find. One of the games of the year, yeah. period. Like, the end of that thing, just incredible. And I think the thing that's, I mean, I guess maybe almost fitting, it's almost like the Red Sox when they finally overcame the Yankees thing. Like, RIT had been so close. Yeah. And so it felt like when for programs and, and organizations that are all, that get so close but can't get over the hurdle, sometimes it takes some type of special, incredible game or moment for it to finally happen. So it seems almost fitting. Like, RIT wasn't going to go blow anybody out to win that first national championship. It was going to have to be dramatic fashion, like yeah. crazy things happen in order to win. And so they finally get it done. They've had so many incredible players come from that program. And that you got guys who are all over the NLL, guys who are playing professionally now that come from that program but none of them did what this group of guys did. I think no, that's yeah. really special. Yeah, that, I think the whole thing was really, really cool and probably deserved a little more recognition. Yeah. So if they able to give them another shout out as they had and probably will reload again as that's what they do in 2022. Yeah. Honorable mention back. goes to Sydney Watson of UConn. I thought yes. maybe she didn't get enough publicity playing for UConn last year. She was a first team All-American, I believe, the IWLC at the end of the year. But at the same time, now getting looks at Team USA. Um, and we, of course, talked to her a couple weeks ago on this program. So um, someone else that that maybe deserved a little bit more recognition, one of the more of the top headline and athletes Great. and playing for a good program that sort of turned that, helped turn that program around at UConn. So that, that's my honorable mention. Yeah, really, really cool. All right, uh, let's move on. And this is one of the things I hinted at before. Five years down the road, 
What will 2021 be remembered for? You take it. I've got two. I don't okay. know if that was allowed or not. No, but... you can do whatever you want. <laughs> this is our we show. Make the, we make the rules. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with lacrosse sixes because I mm. think uh, you look – at back at history of sports, and of course, you said five years down the road, but I'm looking more like seven years down the road in 2028 Fine. when the Olympic Games are being held in LA, and possibly we see lacrosse there, and it's gonna be this iteration. And this was the year in which they had settled on a format that they would try and get lacrosse into the Olympics, and we really got to finally see it unveiled and utilized and practiced around the world. And, and I think for the growth of the game and the sport, it's, it's it's an important factor. It's an important discipline as well. So I think, you know, a few years down the road, people could look back and say, remember when that was just starting out? And yeah. then you're going to see, well, look at what this has become just a short time later within a decade and hopefully for the lacrosse's sake in the Olympics as well. So I can't wait to look back and be like, oh, remember we were still talking to this, these couple guys from England and Scotland yeah. and, the, and pe people from America about, oh, remember they first their first thoughts of it and just trying to figure it out with, with Andy Shea and, and everybody else. And just, you know, I think that's kind of a cool thing to feel like we're at the ground level of it right now and in a few years we'll be looking back at it too. And talking to coaches about like just having – a blank slate. There's no st previous strategy in sixes. Like you take some from the field and maybe t some from box and different drills that you've run, but like there's no real strategy that's ever been established. No. So having some of the best minds now in the sport look at this thing with fresh eyes and go, all right, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's yeah. see what works. That's to me is fascinating. Yeah. My second one is I think that people will talk five years down the road about Boston College women and their championship win. And I, obviously Charlotte North's a big part of that. And I just really think that people are going to say, yeah, remember Charlotte North, but also remember Boston College needed to win this one because this is the fourth straight time they had been to the championship game. Finally got it done. Finally got it done and came through at the end. So I feel like you will look back years from now, no matter what happens with Boston College or wherever in women's lacrosse, and you'll say, yeah, that was the year that BC got it done with Charlotte North, of course, having the gigantic year that she had. Because I don't know if 2021 is going to be the year of Charlotte North. I think it could be 2022. Okay. I mean, you could say both are. Okay, combo. But 2022 has a potential for back-to-back um, to war tons, back to back championships and also women's world championships that she could also make a name for herself. So I'm not calling it the year of Charlotte North yet. Okay. I thought maybe that could happen in 2022. It's when BC avoided the, the old Buffalo Bills. Right, exactly. Thing. You, know, you yeah. get there, you're yeah. so close. You know, And you know what? I think you look back at it and maybe five years down the road, you look at this as what stapled Boston College at the top with in the conversation with North Carolina and Maryland, as opposed to a team like a Syracuse that hasn't won that championship yet, has been close, but I don't know if you can quite consider them in that upper echelon of Maryland, North Carolina yet when you haven't won one. Now, Boston College has won one. Five years down the road, did they add a couple more to then put themselves in that kind of legacy conversation yeah. as some of the great programs in the sport. Yeah, the start of maybe something great and it, yeah. uh, the continuation of what, of course, was laid with you know Sam Apuzo, Dempsey Arsenault, and um, that whole, Kenzie Kent, that whole gang. So I'm going to stay in the college game for mine. And for mine, it's a much broader thing, something that we uh, esta had, was established in all of college sports, and it's the name, image, and likeness. Mm. Because... For me, look, I, it's gotten a lot of pub in basketball and football, deservedly so, because there are big numbers out there. We're not talking about big numbers right now in college lacrosse of like what these guys and girls are being paid. They're obviously able to do clinics, and I think that's important. And th things that they weren't able to benefit from before when they were in college, they're able to benefit from now. And I think that's great. But if you look now down the road of what this kind of outlines is – when you have those transcendent type talents come along, does it encourage them to stay with the sport longer? Like if Paul Rabel comes in and becomes what he became or Kyle Harrison, now both of them stayed in the sport, luckily, but one of them easily could have been torn away and said, hey, let's go do something else. How yeah. many great players did we see decide when they got out of college because there wasn't a roadmap to making money playing professional lacrosse, decide to go do something else. Like, how many great players do we lose? Well, mm -hmm. does this keep more around because you develop a brand, you make some money while you're in college, and then all of a sudden, it's not starting from scratch when you're finally done Memorial Day weekend of your senior year. Like, there's something built up 
that you now can capitalize on more now that you're no longer going to school and playing for a team. And some of that will evolve with the different pro leagues. But I think it sets a big roadmap. Um, and also, I honestly, like if you're going to be a mid-level basketball or football player somewhere for some mid-level school, or you can be one of the best players in college lacrosse, what are you going to choose? Because right now, I think some of it's mid-level football or basketball, whatever, for some of these players. But if you're going to be one of the top whatever players in the country and then you can benefit off of that, I think it maybe keeps more people playing lacrosse because I do think that there is a market for being one of the great players in lacrosse and turning that into success long term financially, as we've seen with different people. I, I just wonder if we're going to look back at this as a way that people were kept in the sport, they built more brands, and ultimately, if they build brands in college and learn to build on that while they're still in school, it should theoretically help the, both the men's and women's pro games because you already have some of that carrying in. Yeah, and you're expanding their stardom in yes. a way because, like you said, you develop that brand and and you get on the 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 table of and the and the, the radar of maybe some people that don't necessarily look at watch lacrosse or yeah. you can you can do a better job of that maybe with using your brand or your name image and likeness and promoting something that can reach a different audience than just a lacrosse audience I mean we all know who Pat Spencer is we all know who Jared Bernhardt is those are two of the biggest stars that come out but maybe not the rest of the nation knows about right. them but you know that they might because they were the two of the best of their craft and they did crossover sports and all of that but you look at the big names and maybe they could have done more with a name image and likeness deal of promoting something for somebody, you know, on a commercial or, you know, because some of these different brands and sports, they love and, and companies, I want to say, love to display different sports when they're doing so. You see, you know, football players with lacrosse sticks. So maybe that's Pat Spencer with a lacrosse stick. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like at the end of the day, maybe it can help expand not only the athletes and the stars in the, in the sport, but also help the sport at the end of the day get a little bit more recognition because of the star power involved. And I do think, too, it clears the way for somebody like a Spencer or Bernhardt, who maybe is not as outspoken as a Rabel or mm. as yeah, good camera point. like out there vlogging on YouTube like Paul did early in his career. Maybe it's a there's a more traditional way for those great, great players to capitalize on this and continue to build their brand in a way that's not, hey, look at me on Instagram. I, because, they, they, like, you look at Spencer and Bernhardt, they don't want to do that th those stuff. And there are great players that didn't want to do that. But they can build their brand in other ways with more traditional things because people, like a company, looks in and goes, this person is tearing it up on the field and we want to tie our brand to them. Yeah, absolutely. And then you get some more eyeballs on the player, more eyeballs on the sport. I exactly. think that's a good thing yeah. at the end of the day. My okay. honorable mention there were transfers. It was the beginning yeah. of the big, you know, there were, have always been transfers, but yeah. I think seeing Michael Sowers at Duke, you got T.D. Erlin at Denver, I thought that was another facet of this year that I think was really unique because of the pandemic and seeing some people that you don't normally see in those spots at the end of their career. I will argue that five years down the road, we will finally be past the extra COVID year, we hope. It's true. <laughs> Cross our fingers. That is true. Let's hope. That's why we'll remember this, right? <laughs> that's we'll be true. Like, oh, because oh, remember when everybody had like six years had a COVID to play year. college yeah, lacrosse? Right? That's another. That's great. Uh, that's, that wasn't my favorite one, but that's something we will remember. <laughs> for sure all right let's look ahead then now not just not five years down the road just to next year bold prediction for 2022 this might not seem all that bold i, don't, I haven't decided how bold you can maybe you can decide i'm gonna go with uh mike sisselberger breaking the 80 percent face-off wow. threshold next year i mean he was 79 79.5 percent to set yep. the record and it feels like this record's getting broken more and more every and more year. every year but it's already been Past 80% in Division Two and Division Three. Connor Farrell did in Division Two a couple years ago. Yep. Actually, last year, Bearden, Hudson Bearden went to Southwestern in Texas, 80.5%. And I just feel like pe and people might, might not think this is bold be because, oh, he's only he 0.5 close, away. Yeah. But I don't think anybody realizes how hard it is to do this and be able to do it again. Yes. Because I don't think Tatiti didn't do it his senior year, right? Did he? I, th I thought he broke it his no, junior year. No, I think he year. did it at U Albany, right? Yeah, I thought he did it earlier in his career, yeah. and then obviously continued to add on to the career stats after that. But. To me, obviously, it's harder to get better and better as the years go on, as different guys see you and adjust to yeah. you as you've been in college a little bit longer. So 
I think, but I think he can do it. I think that he is talented enough, and like we, you're going to see with Greg Grenley in a little bit, we talked to him about. It. He goes, yeah, some of these rules have made that sep- they're making the separation even bigger because that they perfect their craft, and the, the guys that are good are just so good it causes everybody else to adjust. And yep. I think Sisselberger certainly has what it takes, and he has. There's more knowledge to all of sports than ever. There's more knowledge of that position and focus on that position than there ever has been. So year after year, you're going to feel like the guys that are great are just going to get better. I think he can do it. I think the interesting thing for him will be how do the other faceoff guys continue to adjust to the new rules? Because I think that was part of it. Like he was comfortable and found a way to execute standing neutral grip better than other people he went up True. against. Yeah. Not, not saying anything. He was a great faceoff guy. I mean, he was highly regarded even yeah. with the old rules. But he was one of the guys that was able to make that transition very quickly and excel. Now, another year for some of these guys. Does, do some of them get a little bit better and learn from what we had last year? Because not everybody transitioned smoothly. We saw that with different face-off guys, especially early in the year. There were guys that just struggled and other guys that excelled. It did, sometimes it was just a, a feeling out process or whatever. So I think that will be another question for him in terms of being that dominant. I don't think there's any question. He's going to be great again. The question is how great. Yeah, and he also had another year to perfect his craft, too. That, too. That's he another argument. That's the other, get better. That's the other you're, side you're of right. the sword. <laughs> He's just going to continue to figure out more ways to I make my argument everybody. a little bit more, though. No, you're right. All right, I am going to go with a pretty bold prediction, especially with some of where they are in and some of the preseason polls. I think the Syracuse men are going to return to championship weekend. This year? This year. I think, and, and, and here is part of my thought process, because I do think with Gary Gate. Give him another year or so down the road. Like, I think this is a program. You have got Joey Spelina coming in next fall for his freshman year. I think there's going to be a lot of hype in like two years about this team. I think they're going to do it before because there's not as much hype. Like, I think this Syracuse program, and I know there's a lot of talk about Gary Gate and Dave Petromala in there. There's not a lot of talk about most of these players. They've got great players coming back like all over the field that are kind of like they're going to be in all American conversations, but they're kind of getting overlooked by all the other talent there is in the ACC and across the country and whatever. I think this is the year because there aren't as many expectations going in. Gary Gate kind of resets things. I mean, if you've ever been at a Gary Gate practice uh, for the Syracuse women's team, it's fun. Mm. It's free flowing. He takes some of the pressure off. I think that's going to be a really good thing for the guys on this team. I just, for whatever reason, I think that they're going to break through this year and do it. I think the the coaching change, taking some of the pressure off the players, they had all the stuff that went on inside the locker room and off the field last year with Chase Scanlon that I think actually brought some of these players closer together. I think all that's going to feed into them having this like sense of relief entering this year that some of the pressure's off. I know you're Syracuse lacrosse, but it just feels like on the players, there's not nearly as much pressure as maybe there is on the coaching staff because of the names that they garner. Like, it's just, it feels different. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go out there on a limb and say Syracuse makes it. It's a, it, I think that's, I mean, you're not wrong in the fact that the change for them could be a positive for the group they currently have. And I think a lot of what they went through could bring them together more than ever. You know what I'm saying? Because they really did bond together um, despite a lot of the things that were going on last season. It's just going to be so tough to sort of get through that ACC schedule oh, with, with what the ACC has. And to me, get a decent enough seed in the NCAA tournament where you're not, where you can, you're never that comfortable but at the end of the day, if like you're going in the NCAA tournament, you're not seeded, and you're playing some of those top seeds, it's going to be really, really tough. And but you I know, think they have to at least maybe win a couple, a game or two in the ACC they're maybe not supposed to. And yeah. I think maybe that really gives them a. Well, better it's like every game. Path. I think they're going to be underdogs in maybe every yeah. ACC game they go going in. We're going to know early. They yeah. play Maryland in February in the Carrier Dome. It's a big day for Syracuse lacrosse. It's when Gary Gates' numbers going up to the rafters. Uh, rafters. Katie Rowan for the Syracuse women's team. Her numbers being retired. Her uh, jersey's being retired. It's going to be a big day in the toward the end of February. We're going to know then what we've got for Syracuse. But I, you know, it's like when coaches go into press conferences and they take all the stuff on them. Like the hiring of Gary Gate and Dave Petromala, I think, has taken all the conversation and put it off of the players 
and onto the coaching staff. And I think right now, it's exactly what the program needs. Yeah, I, I mean, it's going to be fun to watch. Like I said, that was my favorite thing is seeing these guys come together. Gary Gate, Dave Petromala. And the first day is going to be weird. And I don't yeah. know if it was weird for the players, but it was weird for us. It doesn't really matter about us. But I think if the players can adjust and, and really take all that knowledge from two of the greats to ever do it, and if they're able to apply that, I, I think you got a point, you know, when it comes to coaching and that impact. But – and I don't know. Be it's gonna, that's, that, that is bold. That is a it's bold a prediction. It's a very bold that prediction. Bold. Yes. They're going to be tested in the ACC, though. The thing is, you can lose three ACC games and still be a top four seed. Yeah. I mean, because the other, the other three teams may also be top four seeds. Right. I know. You, you, yeah, that, you, don't, never, you never know. And like you said, there if, you if they can maybe win a couple, I think they maybe have a better chance at that. Will be fun. Uh, anyway, let's turn our attention to a team that is making a run to the playoffs Right now, we got Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers long snapper Zach Triner joining us now. Zach, uh, thanks so much for taking some time. During a busy time of year for you guys, gearing up for a playoff run. How are things going down there in Tampa? So far, so good. So You guys are up in Boston, so we actually have plenty of people knocking on our door to come down here this time of year. So any, any excuse you can get to come down to Florida and get out of that New England weather, it's pretty yeah. good down here. Yeah, we should mention Massachusetts natives. So we're up here in the freezing cold, and he's living the life, not only playing in the NFL, but also doing it in a warm city. It's no surprise Tom decided to go to Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say between the, the weather and the income tax, we got some pretty good privileges down <laughs> For sure. Uh, so, Zach, you talk about your career, and – People likely know who, who watch us here at, at Lack Sports Network that you are a former lacrosse player. You played at Siena for a year. You were a face-off guy. I wonder, you're a, fa you're a specialist now in terms of being a long snapper playing football, and obviously you were a specialist in, in being a face-off guy when you played college lacrosse. What are the similarities between the specialties and what you do now and, and what you did when you played the lacrosse in the college game? Yeah, I don't know why I, I gravitate towards those specialties, but it's honestly the same exact thing from lacrosse to football, like very equivalent position. It's you it's you versus another guy in terms of face-offs, and there's a couple of moves that you got to pull off. And then, you know, when it comes to long snapping, it's it's really just a mental thing. Can you get the routine down? Can you fall into that rhythm? Can you just do it over and over and over and at a high level? So, you know, I don't know what it was, but facing off – that was something I had a blast doing early on. Someone taught me how to do it, and I realized that was the quickest way to get the ball in your stick and kind of start some things off. And then, you know, football came came calling, and someone else was like, hey, you might as well learn this tool as well if you know how to face off. It's pretty similar. And, and you know, fortunately, I took up both offers because it's led to a, a whole bunch of riches for me. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It's very, like, mentality-wise, it's it, like you said, it's so similar in that it's a very individual part of each sport. You know, because I feel like they're in a team sport at that as well, both facing off like the face off guys, you know, they go off and do their thing. Everybody else sort of gets to have the, you know, the five on five, six on six time or whatever it might be, whatever you're scrimmaging. Same thing with football. It's the mentality. I mean, the, the, like you said, the similarities really strike me and just the, the individualistic nature inside a team sport of, of the nature of what you do. Yeah, it's, it's honestly, so the same exact thing when it comes to the rides, the clears, the face offs, like the special teams of lacrosse hasn't necessarily like they haven't formalized themselves as much as football, but it's the same exact thing. Like you said, like when I was taking faceoffs, it was myself, my wing to the left, wing to the right. It's the same exact thing. Now I'm snapping the ball. I have the punter. I have the kicker and we work in threes. And like you said, the similarities are, are just awesome. There is a whole bunch of carryover because of that. Like men, we joke with faceoff guys and we have Greg Renlian uh, on the show this week as well. We, we joke with them. There's like this mentality thing. It's like, you gotta be a little, little nuts to just be like this is my thing like I'm going one-on-one -on -one against this guy and like mano y mano they kind of go off to the side and practice like is it is, is it a mentality thing like knowing hey this is like my job I'm going to focus on this one thing and I'm going to be really good at it 100 percent. so you have to tell Greg I said hello so we've had some exchanges back and forth and he's someone I looked up to for years so yeah I don't know what it is the, the mentality of like you're going to go off on your own away from the team like you guys said but then when it comes time to the game or, you know, fourth quarter and it's 13, 13 with a, a couple of minutes left, like, OK, we're going to want Greg. Let's use Greg as an example to go out there, win the face off. We have a lot of confidence in him because when he does go out there on his own, we know he's working really hard and it's going to benefit the team. It's the same thing for the snap. Like when it comes down to a, a game winning snap, 
you know that all that time we put in on the sideline is to come down to this moment, a couple last seconds. Okay, we're going to make this field goal because we put in the time. You know, Zach, I find it really impressive, really cool that, you know, I think nobody would have blamed. I know there's other crossover athletes in football in the NFL, at the, you know, in other sports too, um, that might have just, you know, gone into that league and just given themselves to football and, and sort of forgotten about other parts of their lives, other sports that sort of helped on their way up. And you've stayed so devoted and, and passionate about lacrosse, you know, even in the midst of, of, you know, winning a Super Bowl and, and, you know, getting this opportunity, of course, of your life. I I guess why you know what has kept your your passion for lacrosse so strong and you wanting to continue to, to grow the game as you have even in your nfl career yeah i think so the the one person i can i think of that's been in, instrumental in my career is brian brecht who's the head coach at rutgers he was the coach at sienna and i remember he was the first guy that was kind of like hey like why don't you come to sienna take some face-offs he i was number zero in high school and he was like and i'll even let you wear number zero here and i was like he just believes in me, man. And I don't know what it was, but it was like that father figure or like that big brother that he was just that first person to be like, you're, you, you're my guy. I'm going to trust you. And I don't know, that really stuck with me. And that was something that I had talked to him. I think it was after the Super Bowl. He had just sent me a text and was like, Hey, you know, what's going on. So like even still being in contact with him, I don't know. There's something about the lacrosse community that it does transcend the sport. It's if you look at all the alumni networks, they're thick. They, they reach back and it's a, a sport that doesn't at the moment have a lot of money at the professional level, but Paul's doing a great job of changing that. And I think all of those small things, it adds to just that rich community of people that want to help each other out. And that's honestly one of the things that drew me to lacrosse. So I'm, I'm happy to, like I said, I'm, I'm a nobody in the sport, but I've been in the sport and I know how important that is. So if there's anything that I can do to help grow that, then you know, I, I take that with a lot of pride. No, you're right. It's a, it's a really special thing about lacrosse. I mean, for me, I never really played the sport, came in to, to work for this network and quickly realized just how tight knit of a community it is here in this sport. Uh, you mentioned Brian Brecht, and I know I had read some articles around the Super Bowl, and you were talking about what may have happened if he didn't leave after your freshman year at Siena to take this Rutgers job. Like, would you have still played at Siena maybe and, and not transferred to Assumption to play college football? Yeah, I, I really don't know. That was something that we were talking about. And the, you know, an aspect of the college sports is it is a business in some sense. And that was like the first eye-opening moment for me when he you know he was like hey I'm doing this for my family and what's best for myself like I said his family and that was just that opened my eyes to the business side of things but it was never a lot of these guys can do it you know, I'll say wrong but if, if you're in your shoes it's hard to say right or wrong but they just kind of they up and leave and he's been someone that has not done that to me I can't speak for everyone else um, so if, if he didn't go that was that was a big moment for me. He left and it gave me an opportunity to look in the mirror and be like, Hey, okay, well, what's best for me and in, in my future family. And yeah, I don't know the, the chapter after he left could have been a lot different had he not left. Yeah. And, and certainly your journey to getting where you are today. I'm, and like, there's people along the way that sort of give you that help. Right. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about in, in life of, of being able to like people like, Oh, look where you come, but you got to look where you come from at the same time. Right. Yeah, hundred percent. And he's a, a great role model for me and, you know, someone that's been instrumental in, in my athletic journey. Did you ever try to like grow the game in the locker room? You know, like, is it ever, cause lacrosse ever come up at all? Like we want to know these things that, you know, like you ever talk to anybody like, Hey, you see that like college game, the championship weekend, anything like that. Like, is if you tried to grow, like, get in the inroads and in, like the NFL circles? Yeah, hundred percent. So uh, one of our defensive tackles, Steve McClendon, uh, his boys are actually pretty good. So we're talking back and forth, like when the PLL season was going on, he was a, there were a couple of the Redwoods. We were going to try to get into the, the facilities. And uh, I know TD is uh, being, having those Albany connections way back. Uh, that was something that we were talking about. And it just, the COVID situation didn't allow for things to line up. But yeah, we're, we're trying to grow the game as best we can as those two guys. But that was, that was one of the things that we were working on is getting a couple of those Redwoods in. Because I know uh, actually our GM, I think his boy, is Jason's boys play lacrosse as well. And our trainer Dutchie, his boys are playing they're pretty good so we got some we got a couple guys that are around the facility 
Okay. I tell you what, it, it, the sport explode, is exploding down in Florida. You got everybody who's like the, in these these uh, programs and organizations. They got kids that are playing the sport now. It's it's really helping. When's the last time you held a stick? Like you throw around at all? Uh, of course, yeah. Actually, I play in the off season still because that's the best way for me to just run around a little bit. And I, I'll tell you what, I played box lacrosse for the first time a couple of years ago, and that kicked my butt. That was. That was a tough thing to 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 learn on the fly, but that it was it was a blast. Yeah, I still pick up the stick. What was it? Why why was it so tough? For you? I don't know. I I had never played it before, and honestly, it's a smaller field. But my wind was like completely different. I was playing defense because I I just didn't have the stick skills or the equipment, honestly, to handle all the the slap checks and the. <laughs> it was just it was a completely different ball game. So that was eye opening, but it's something I think I I'd keep uh, keep doing in the in the future. Would you ever go back and try again, you know, maybe and see and dabble, like do a tryout with one of these pro teams that you're about 30 years old now, you know, yeah. at the end at the end of the <laughs> line, whenever you're done winning Super Bowls, you know? I, I don't know. I never say never, but the my stick skills, it's like, <laughs> it's like if you don't play Fortnite for a couple months, those builders are way ahead of you. So I don't know if my stick skills would be able to keep up with that. But I, actually in that same indoor league, I know I, I went against Nardella in the face-off X. I, he, he probably got the edge, but I like to think I held my own. But it was, <laughs> it was a blast. You steal a couple away from them. and then you exactly. know, He's like, oh, really? I'm supposed to go 100% against this guy. <laughs> That's well, great. When, when you look at your football career, it, it, I mean, because, like, at Assumption, you're, you're playing defense. And then all of a sudden, and then you find an opportunity to be a long snapper at the next level. Walk people through, like, how that opportunity came along for you and when you realized – hey, you know what? I may actually be able to turn this into a career. Yeah, so we actually had a, a great long snapper before me at Assumption. Uh, Sam Previty, Brockton guy, he slung the thing. He was next quarterback, so I'm talking like he threw that thing way harder than I did, and I was like, hey, there's no need for me to try to do this because you are excellent at this. And then he graduated, and I had one more year. And I was like, hey, I'm happy to do this if you guys need it. And fortunately, is one of the again, one of those things another coach just – instrumental in my career um, between coach Barisi, who's now at Bryant and then coach Chesney, who's the head coach at Holy Cross. We ran a pro style punt, which it just means that the snapper has to block someone as opposed to a free release. And I, I don't know why we did it. I think we might've been the only school across D one, D two, D three. There might've been two or three schools that did it and we did it. And it just gave me an edge going into the, the NFL. And again, I don't know someone's looking over me, I guess. It's really cool. I yeah. Mean, what a journey, right? I mean, the, the, the think of the, it's the little things that had to happen along the way, right? Yep. Yeah, that's yep. awesome. I did want to ask you, I, I'm sure I'm, if you haven't seen Jared Bernhardt, obviously a fair, it's fair State, from, former Maryland guy, right? Yep. Yeah, I, I was wondering, because I think perspective's important in all of this, too. I'd like you to maybe, because as someone who plays professional football, and like you just, you're rattling off D1, D2, D3, you have a good knowledge of college as well. You know, what he did at the Division II level this year, can you put it into perspective for those who might not know, you know, what the meaning of all that is, maybe compared to Division I or wherever else he might have gone, um, just his impact he made at the Division II level at Ferris State this past season, going from lacrosse to football? Yeah, I, so I think when you hear Division II, oftentimes it's like a, a throwaway or, okay, he couldn't cut it at Division I. But, w- like, when you're talking Ferris State, it's – it's Ferris State, it's Shepard, it's those guys, and they're like the best of the best in D2, and he was able to go there and, and be so dominant, like especially for him as a skill position. Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. the skill positions, there's really not – there is, but there's not as much discrepancy there in the skill positions as the O-line, D-line. Like that's where the, the big, big difference is. So for him to go there and dominate the, the way that he did, like that's no easy task. He should be proud of that, and people should take notice. It's a yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, also, a big deal is the fact that you've got a Super Bowl ring. We were joking about it before. I mean, that's it. That is like lifetime journey, like everything that anybody could have ever asked for, and you've got one. When did it sink in that not only are you playing on this team last year that is uh, has a chance to contend for a Super Bowl, but when did it sink in like th- like this is it? Like I have an opportunity here in front of me, and I'm part of something that is. I, I'm part of a, something that is called a world champion. Yeah, I think there was two moments. There was one, so being a Boston guy, when Tom signed to the team, that was like, all my friends were like, 
are you serious? This is really the situation that you stumbled into. I'm like, I don't know. Like, Jay, I don't, yes, somehow I did. Uh, and then when we were in the Super Bowl, after we had won, it, it, there's this weird, weird feeling of like this huge buildup all year to the Super Bowl, right? All these teams are fighting for it. The massive two week buildup, even with COVID, of, of this one game, the pinnacle, the height is reached, and then the game's over. And then everything stops, and we're walking back. Like, there's no normal logistics, so everything just stops. And the three of us, Bradley, Ryan, myself, are walking back to the facility, which is, you know, a couple blocks away because of our cars are parked there. And we're just walking back, going through the fans because we can. Nobody knows who we are. Everyone else, you know, wouldn't be able to do that. But we're just walking back, and there's just peace over us. Like, wow, I just can't believe that this has happened. And, you know, the guys that give us this opportunity, like Jason and Keith, the GM and the special teams coordinator and Bruce, the head coach, like he changed our lives forever because he thought about us. And, you know, it comes back to that Brian story, Brian Brecht. And, you know, when you reach back and you believe in someone, like it makes a huge impact. And I, I'll speak for myself when I'll be forever grateful to those guys. I think I saw an interview you did with the NLL in which you talked about being in the parade and how it reminds you of the duck boats, right? Like <laughs> yeah. And growing yep. up. So did, did you go to, to like a duck boat parade when the Patriots had won? Like a, a uh, Super Bowl? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I, so I, and I probably wore my uh, – there was a – Lonnie Paxton was the snapper for the, the Super Bowl champion Patriots, and I had his jersey and I had the luxury of meeting him in San Diego one time. I was like, all my buddies knew I was going to fanboy. I'm like, hey, I, I got to get this out of my system. Like I had your jersey growing up. I'm a huge fan. He's like, why would you have my jersey? You might be the only non-family member with my jersey. So – it was a cool time. Yeah, I definitely went to one of those, one or two of those boat parades. So, so, it had, so it had to be surreal to be a part of one, to be to be the one <laughs> that people were coming to, like, not that it was a duck boat parade, but you like that you mentioned the comparison similarities of being on the water, but like being in that sort of scene of being a part of that parade, I can't, I can't imagine what that one must have been like. Definitely. Yeah, my wife and I were on that. So there's actually a little story before the logistically we're going back and forth. My wife and at the time we had one daughter are back home and we're like, okay, when's this boat parade going to be? Not really sure. And then it, it got moved up for a couple of reasons last minute. And my wife was about to step on the plane and I called her. I'm like, Hey, it's going to be tomorrow. You got to turn around. So she, as she's walking onto the plane, she turns around and comes home. And then we we're able to go on that parade and like, look out to everyone and just share that moment together. It was, it was unbelievable. That's it, special. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. I, you mentioned it, like, Obviously, you grew up in New England. You're a Patriots fan. You're a Tom Brady fan growing up, and, and you watch what he did. he's done. Now you share a locker room with the guy, and so much is made about, like, the type of leader he is and what it's like to be part of one of those teams. Like, I mean, I don't even know if there's anybody in the sport of lacrosse you can equate it to. Like, put, put it in perspective. Like, what's it like to be on a team and in a locker room with a guy that is that great? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, Paul still was still playing this year. It would be like either playing with him or one of the gates, like at their height. And to be able to watch how they carry themselves, to be able to watch how they interact with teammates um, and then be able to play alongside him. Like there, there's a lot of things that you might not be able to verbalize, but just watching how he carries himself. Like I said, watch how he interacts, watch how he handles the strategic side of things on the micro scale, on the macro scale. It's it's just invaluable, and I'll I'll be you know I'll take those skills with me uh, for as long as I live. Yeah, and that's the impact a guy like that can make, right, on your organization, on your life too. Yeah, that seems like. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. There's no surprise. You know, he came here, and we started to win, so it's a, <laughs> a huge impact on everyone. Sorry, right, how you feeling now? I mean, we're around like the holidays and all that. I mean, we're getting into that sort of st the, the stretch run, couple weeks to go, Zach. What's the vibe like of the team right now? Yeah, I think. To, there's you hit the end of the season and there's a, a little bit of a moment of like a recharge it's hard to explain but the season is so long it's such a grind that you get to a certain point and it's like man is this ever going to end and then on the other side of that there's like this recharge and re-energize of like okay we see our plan we see our goal it's in sight this is what we have to do to get there and there's like this this new energy that kind of goes over everyone. And I think we're starting to hit that, that side of the peak. And, you know, there's a lot of excitement because of that. So we're ready to go play the jets this week, go back up North and, uh, you know, take it a week at a time.
How difficult, how much of a challenge has everything around COVID made this season for you? Obviously, with thoughts to the people that have impacted the most, but also just at a sport level, too, of the locker room and everything that goes along with that, your coaches and, and, and the other guys. And obviously, we've seen it go through all the sports worlds. So just wondering your sort of perspective on what that's been like. Yeah, so I, I was actually on the COVID list a couple weeks ago. And it, for me, it was, it was I didn't even know I had it. Um, but I know logistically being one of the player reps for the teams, we kind of have to figure out and navigate like, okay, this is what we're doing. Okay. Now the rules are changing. This is what one person's saying, or this is what the NFL is saying, the NFL PA, the CDC, and just keeping up with all those things has been tough. Uh, especially, you know, being the NFL or the MLB or the NBA, we have a real, we're in a position to take a position of leadership and do the right thing. And by doing that, it just makes things a little bit you know, more complicated, but we're trying our best, trying to finish the season strong, make sure we don't miss any games and uh, make sure we get that Super Bowl off the ground again. Yeah. Uh, one more for you here, Zach, before we let you go. Uh, obviously, the, the sport was rocked by the news that John Madden passed away here earlier this week. I, for somebody now who plays in the league, and I'm sure you've played the video game, like seeing yourself in the video game is like how surreal is that? Uh, I haven't played Madden in a while, but I know when I did play it growing up, I would play that thing for hours on end. And it's been it's been pretty cool, actually, amidst the tragic passing of Mr. Madden. Like, it's been really cool to see everyone post how impactful he was on their lives. You know, sometimes someone might pass away and I personally would be like, oh, wow, that was, you know, I had a moment for that person and I might not put it on Twitter. So to have people put themselves out there on Twitter, like you have to get to a certain, you have to be a little bit more impactful than everyone else for them to do that. So to see everyone, like everyone do that, he, name one more person that's been more impactful in a, a sport than John Madden. And, you know, it's been pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazing. I've, I've listened to a whole bunch of interviews about it um, the last couple of days. And just the people that are like, oh, when he's a broadcaster, people, he was so good at being a broadcaster, they didn't realize that he was also a Hall of Fame coach. And then the same thing with the video game. People didn't realize he was a Hall of Fame broadcaster and a coach before that. I mean, three-pronged, like the impact all in, like you can't do much more than that. I don't think other than playing itself, <laughs> but you don't, you just throw that out the window at this point for him, like the, to imagine the impact he's made. It's just incredible. Yeah, and I think he was a head coach at like 32 or 33 and then had a Hall of Fame career in 10 years and then cut it off and then moved on to something else. Like, he's just one of the most interesting guys in the world. So, wait, but we got to get to one more thing here. You, you haven't, like, seen yourself in the video game? Like, you got to pull up Madden, man. <laughs> what are you're you, what are you trying game. to get at? What are you trying to get at here? <laughs> like, I don't know. You're in the game. I, I know. I, so, I am the worst rated player in Madden. <laughs> So if, if that's what you're trying to get at, then I've, I've, I've had no. a, a couple words with Ocho Cinco. That didn't move my rating at all. I had a couple tackles last week. That didn't move my rating at all. So I don't know what it is. They have it out for the lacrosse player, I guess. Are, are you really? You're the worst? Yeah, yeah. What's, what's your rating? Okay, so like that's 50? fair. That's why I, I you haven't I don't, played. I think it was – I don't know. My, I have to go back. My friends always make fun of me for it. So it's, I'm it's so sorry. Embarrass, yeah. Embarrassingly low. Oh, man, so now I know why you haven't played. That would make me mad, too. I get it completely. <laughs> I, you can boycott the game all you want. I will. I will until I move up to a, a, a 35 overall as opposed to a 30. <laughs> You've won a Super Bowl. Like, yeah, it's a Super Bowl winning team would not have the lowest ranked player. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm now I'm mad. We'll like, work on it. <laughs> we'll make some calls. Yeah. It's okay, Zach. You, you, you got a ring. You know, that's... that's well, I'll, I'll take the ring over the, the Madden rating any day. Yeah, you got two girls. Everything's going fine. You know, yeah. don't worry. We're, we're going to just push that aside. <laughs> it's Everything's okay. <laughs> Zach, man, we, we appreciate the time so much. We'll work on the Madden rating, but keep doing what you're doing. Good luck here on the stretch run. We'll be rooting for you guys uh, down the stretch, and hopefully you can make another push here in the playoffs. Thanks, guys. All right, so Greg Renling enjoys us now. He's going to be presenting at LaxCon here soon. But first, before we get to that, Greg, I got to ask, I mean, you've still posted the stuff on Instagram. How's lifting going? Like, are, are you maxing out? I mean, where are your highs at? Have, have you peaked? Are you plateaued? I'm just curious because you're out there. You're doing it. You're moving some weight, man. How's it going? 
Uh, I appreciate that. I'm just lifting to stay young now. Um, <laughs> Now that I got two guys, now I got two boys, I got to try to stay young. So that's that's what I've been basically doing. Well, it, I mean, you got to – when you see, like, the Michael – the uh, Sisselberger videos and uh, La Sala, La Sala yeah. down at Virginia, like, what what goes through your mind when you see these college guys and what they're throwing up? I love it because when I was early in my pro career, I was this weird outlier of a meathead because I lifted – and now it's commonplace in our sport, which I love to see, especially amongst face-off guys. So we take a huge beating, and I'm glad to see guys are padding up by getting those traps and those quads going. So it's actually pretty awesome. It's probably got to fire you up a lot, right? I mean, like you're oh, joking, uh, like a bunch of mini beasts out there, right? That's that's what you've done. I got to tell you, when, Petey, when Petey's squat was posted, you, you see immediately some of like the typical trolls are like, oh, what about his depth? And like, it, it took every ounce of my being not to get and just start firing away at these people and be like, you have no idea how impressive that is, what this kid just did. So, yeah, I love it. I love it. We were talking uh, with Lars Tiffany about it. Like, tell people, like, when you talk to kids about, like, what lifting did for your game and how does it affect the face-off position, especially with the standing neutral grip? Like, what advantages is all this stuff doing for these guys? Well, I think we have to remember that even though it's cool to be big, it has nothing to do with being good at face-offs. Um, so Jay Dyer and I were actually having a discussion a couple weeks ago. Some guys are, they have to look out for what their, what their weaknesses are. Some guys need to be stronger, but not necessarily bigger. Some guys have to be faster, but not necessarily stronger. I think speed, um, mobility, and the ability to stave off injury is the most important thing. The limiting factor for most face-off guys is injury. So our ability to repetitiously do something 30 times a game at full speed without getting hurt is the cornerstone to being a successful face-off man at the collegiate level. So being strong and squatting a lot is, is super cool, but training for power and then mobility and endurance is the most important thing. Yeah, and obviously you've you provided the blueprint for yeah. that. I mean, was there a point in like your career, your life, where you sort of realized that? I think you've spoken about that before where you sort of thought, okay, I have to start – you know, reinvesting a little bit into this and, and in my body to be able to do that like on a daily basis or a weekly basis? Yeah, I, I learned the hard way. I, I was all about being as strong and powerful as possible for a long time, even when I was early as a strength coach in New York City. And I started to realize that my body wasn't going to be able to handle that. And, and I had three or four surgeries in my time as a pro. I, I never learned not to play hurt like an idiot. Um, so now when I'm you know, trying to be a mentor to my FOA guys, I'm trying to explain to them how to be knowledgeable about this, how to be more intelligent about this. And I mentioned to you guys before we got on the air that I'm working on a project, and, and my hope is long-term that it will help educate athletes so that not only they can get stronger and faster, but also take care of themselves. And I think with standing neutral grip, you're going to see guys' career last way longer. The knee down years, I mean, it took years off my life. So I'm just glad that these guys are actually going to be able to play healthier longer now. So you talk about getting a chance to, to teach these kids, and, and you're dealing with especially a lot of middle school and high school players as they try to, to take their games to the next level at, at the face-off position. When the change was made to standing neutral grip, and now the players know, like, this is it, at least for the foreseeable future, What's been the change now at the high school and middle school levels of the adjustments of different players that you coach on a regular basis? It's a great question. I think, you know, early on, Jerry and I were very dismayed by the fact that when the rule was changed, we immediately started pumping out content for free to help parents and coaches and players understand standing neutral grip. And because we were so feverishly trying to help, we got so much backlash of like, how can you just accept this change? And, and we were like, because we're adults, we could sit on Instagram and cry about this, but that's not going to help the kids. So we're glad people have understood it. We're glad people have come around. My kids, you know, especially some that were a little bit whiny at the beginning, have thanked me for doing that. And I'm glad that they've come around. But I think for the Federation rules, I have to give USA Lacrosse a ton of credit. And one of the reasons I'm excited for this year's LaxCon Rick Lake, USA Lacrosse, when they were discussing the Federation rules, um, updating them based on the NCAA rules, not only did they have a huge focus on getting it right from a technical standpoint and keeping kids safe, but they really wanted to help the officials. And they wanted to make this a more black and white face-off uh, to make it easier for officials long-term from an education standpoint. 
so that everyone can understand the standing neutral grip face-off for the next generation. And I'm really excited about the changes and tweaks they've made. Why do you think now is the time? I think that's something you've asked for in the last few years, especially. Why do you think now? I mean, you think that movement, it's just, it's just time for that sort of that emphasis, that point of emphasis to be on display here? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And, and, and under, uh, honestly, it just requires the right people at the right time. Mm -hmm. I think we have a huge issue with ego in this sport, and I, I get it. Maybe some people are just sick of hearing my voice, um, but you know it bothers me that I've been this advocate for years on cleaning up the face-off and helping people educate themselves, and I'm trying to reach out to officials and help them, and I get so much pushback from every side and all the time from people who just have no interest in making it better. I have no more skin in the game. Everything you see behind me, my career's done. So for me, it's just about helping the sport moving forward. And if we're going to change the rules every two years because we don't understand the position, and then we have a bunch of people that are, you know, interpreting the rules who've never faced off, and then they're just going rogue on their own and interpreting it 10 different ways, we change the rules and the kids are the ones who suffer every two years. So if we can get everybody in the room to say, look, swallow your pride, let me help you explain exactly how we can make this easier for everybody, and then just do it. We don't have to keep doing this every two years and, and this mess. I cringe every rule year because it's like, here we go again. So I'm just trying to help, and I wish people would understand that. And, and that's a really important concept when you think of what lacrosse is trying to do globally, right? When you're trying to teach these things, and of course, you know, depending on what iteration discipline you're playing. But still, if you're trying to teach the sport, you probably should get everybody on the same page in that aspect, like you said, and that point of emphasis and making it more black and white instead of open to interpretation. So someone in, in England isn't learning it differently than somebody in the U.S. and whatnot. Exactly. And, and what, what frustrates me the most is every day I wake up and go, it's simple. It, it really is simple. If we just do X, Y, and Z, and we all agree to do it, these kids won't have to worry about rule changes. Everyone from all over the globe will be able to do it very simple. Um, you know, you take the PLL rules, for instance, we tried to make the PLL rules the first year. It was great. It was clean. Got The whole league was within like eight or nine percent face off wise. And then things went rogue. And now we see all of this mess and, and guys are going early on every face. So, like, I'm just trying to do my best to help. Um, and for some refs, it's easier to get on Twitter and yell at me than to just fix it. So we'll see. Uh, but I have to give USA Lacrosse a ton of credit. We're going we're gonna to touch on it during LaxCon's presentation for sure. Uh, one more thing about the, the college game here. What did we learn for the first year of standing neutral grip, at least in your estimation, from how, whether it was how it was officiated, what we saw results-wise? Like, what do you think people should take away from what we learned in that first year? The positives are that face-offs can truly be a chess match now. Every move has a strength and a weakness, and it's way more about how many different moves that you can do and that you can perfect to go out there and have the right move against the right opponent than it used to be if I just was faster at doing this with my right hand, I would just bash you the whole game. So that's the good news. There's no excuse to have a 5% face-off game because you can do this at a high level with a whole bunch of different moves. The, the, the bad side of it was it was during COVID, and the officials had no problem letting guys get real close to the ball, crowd, cheat, go early, um, because you know it was COVID, so they needed to stay back. If they continue to do that, you're going to continue to see people hating face-offs because people are going to cheat, and, and that's the way it goes. Now, the other part of it is every time the Rules Committee changes the rules, the, the top one or two guys separate themselves even further. So now Mike Sisselberger is just blowing people off the planet, and they're, I know the Rules Committee had an idea, like, let's keep it more 50%. It, look, if you keep messing with the rules, you understand what you're doing. It's going to get worse. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, if the officials do a good job, we'll, think we'll see things normalize. Interesting, for sure. Yeah. Um, we mentioned uh, LaxCon here, Greg, January 14th through 16th in Baltimore this year. Uh, what should some people who are going to expect from your presentation and what to look for? Yeah, so we've been doing this for a long time. I love LaxCon. I love educating the coaches. I love the, the dynamic and the, and the conversations we have. I learn stuff every year. Um, so what Jerry and I are going to do on the live demo field this year is we are going to go over the FOA system based on how we would coach a session. How would we coach a practice? Not only the technical aspects of it, but the wing play aspects of it. Also the conditioning aspects of it, because baseball guys have a unique skill set and in a unique way that they need to be in shape for a game. Then we're also going to get into the rules, because we have officials come every year and take a look. 
and we'll open it up to a Q&A on how we can make it more black and white for officials, make it easier for them to referee the face-off position so their lives are easier. Well, I think you, you hit on something in, in teaching the coaches because I, I think some coaches are like, all right, well, they go, to, they go to you or Jerry or whoever, and they learn the face-off position, and then we're going to set the two guys off on the side and, and do it. And they sometimes don't have an understanding on it, especially what you're talking about with standing neutral grip. It may be more important now than ever for coaches to understand the position and be able to help these face-off guys figure out, all right, well, if that didn't work, why don't we go try this the next time you go out there? You're absolutely right. And there's a reason that it's, it's a terrible business decision, let's be honest. Since we've started – we have pumped out over you know, hundreds of free videos on YouTube. We come to LaxCon every year and give away all of our information. We help every college coach, club coach, or high school coach that wants to come to one of our training sessions nearby and learn for free. This isn't our information. This is the sports. So our whole thought is, look, kids will still come to us and train, and, and, and our business will be fine. But if my kid learns from me and then he goes off to college and the college coach doesn't know what he's doing – that kid's going to suffer a plateau and not have a great career. So if we can offer this information to coaches so that they can reiterate what we're saying, we know the trajectory of the athlete will continue and everyone will be happy. So that's kind of why we are so adamant about teaching our system for free on all these different situations, because we believe in it. We, we know, obviously, look at our staff. I mean, what we've done is, is proof enough that our, our resume should say what we teach works. Yeah, and we were talking before we started here with name, image, and likeness. Obviously, that is something that you have also rolled with, you know, as the Faceoff Academy has continued to evolve here. And, and we see we talk oh, so much about the athletes, you know, and, and what they do with it, but also you're on the other end of the spectrum and, and, and sort of helping them improve their brand and, and also get their names out there too, which I think is really interesting, you know, in, these, in this day and age, right? Well, I appreciate that. And I think one of the things we wanted to stay away from was, like, endorsing a kid. Right. Especially a kid that I didn't personally coach. That would make no sense at all. That would be that would look really bad business wise. Right. Don't train with me because then you'll be good enough for me to endorse you one day. But also we coach all these kids. Who am I to endorse one kid but not another? So what we decided to do was create basically an internship, a paid internship situation. So we have Tommy Burke. We have Jax Popovich, Mike Sisselberger, Tyler Sandoval, Jake Falk, guys that we've been coaching since they were this big who have now proven that the FOA system works and they've done it at the highest level in college, but they also have aspirations to possibly be a full-time FOA coach one day. So now we have a two or three year work internship program where we teach them how to be an FOA coach, teach the system correctly. We help them with their uh, process and then we set them up for a full-time job when they graduate college. On top of it, like we had mentioned before we got on there, my youngest brother, Mark Renlin is a sports agent now. He represents Jake Withers and a few other players. And his job is to help them from a marketing standpoint on creating their own brand. So, you know, we look at it as a big brother internship situation that sets these guys up for success. Different world, uh, even than when you were in college. Like, could you imagine talking about your brand when you were playing at Penn State? No one would have followed my brand. <laughs> Come on, get a shirt that said Beast on it, something like that. Uh, shell out plenty of no money. Way. Who is this weird shaved head guy from Penn State coming into the league calling himself Beast? I heard that enough. No way. We have, I mean, we've got some great pictures. Maybe we'll have to pull them back out someday as we get ready uh, for uh, for another <laughs> season. We'll get you. We'll get you back into CAA lacrosse, and we'll uh, we'll get rolling with some some throwback photos. I'm excited for CAA lacrosse, man. I can't wait. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Tommy, anything else? For, for Greg? Um, I, I, no, I think we're good. I mean, I, I did want to ask him about a couple of – and that was a good way to end, but I'm going to keep it going here. Just the some of the guys that have gone from the field to the NLL, I, I, did, I just wondering you sort of – because we saw TD make his debut um, just the other day. Just some, your take on that and the transition some of these guys have had to make as a face-off guy. Obviously, it's a different ball game in, inside on, on the floor. I'm um, just wondering, you know, what you have seen in your experience with that. Yeah, I mean, Americans have a huge advantage as face-off guys in the NLL. Um, and, you know, you have Jake Withers and Trevor Baptiste who have been the top of that league for the last couple of years. I know Brendan Fowler was in the league for a couple of years, and he, I mean, he set a record his first year in the NLL. So, you know, you speak to anybody who plays lacrosse at a high level, indoor is such a blast. And, um, you know, I think TD jumping in midseason against Trevor, you know, it took a lot of guts that i think he was just under 50 percent which is really impressive he held his own yeah so um 
you know, and Trevor just steamrolls everybody in that league. So, yeah, I think uh, it's pretty impressive stuff, and, and I hope it, it continues because if guys can stay healthy, and that was my problem, is stay, keeping up with that grind while also having another job, mm. playing lacrosse year-round was just not in the cards for me. So I'm glad to see guys able to pull it off. Cool. Well, uh, you can see Greg at, at LaxCon uh, coming up here next month, and, and you make sure to check out his uh, speaker series if you're going to be there. We'll also hopefully have him back as part of our CAA broadcast here this year. Greg, we appreciate the time. As always, we'll talk soon. Always a pleasure. Happy holidays, guys. You too, Greg. Thanks. So uh, thank you to Greg for taking some time. One thing we didn't get to in the interview that we actually talked about uh, off-camera is uh, Greg went back uh, over Thanksgiving weekend. Headstrong Foundation is doing this great thing, rivalry games outside of Pennsylvania between high school alumni teams. Greg played for Springfield mm. Uh, mm. against their rivals Ridley, a really special thing with the, the Cole Lurie family and, and where Nick went to school. And it was Springfield Ridley. Greg did take faceoffs, but it was a dramatic, dramatic game. Two to one in overtime. So Greg did take a couple of faceoffs, and he won him. He won 100. percent He just yeah. didn't have a lot of effort there. So one of one of the <laughs> great defense, game. one of the great defensive struggles yeah. of, of the, all time. Hey, that's the that's the best kind of game, a defensive struggle. You know how I feel about those. I love a good defensive struggle. That Super Bowl we had a couple years ago. Ah, oh, that's not. It was like what 10 to three, not. seven three. By the way, I, one of the other rivalry games, Jeff Connors, former Virginia star. Uh, starred in that one. Oh, okay. More scoring in that game for Strathaven. Oh, all right, all right. So not Good. all of these rivalry games yeah. were well, quite as Maybe as we'll tough. bring it up with Greg at LaxCon. We'll talk to him then. Yes, all talk right. to him about the Headstrong game. <laughs> uh, shout out to Headstrong and raising money for, uh, for a great cause. Yeah, and, absolutely. Cool. Well, that'll do it. 2021 is done. In the books. In the books. We did it. We made it. And 2022, like they said, We'll close the door very quietly, and we'll come in. Hopefully, and, and we've make got sure good things to talk good, about. Good things are going to happen, and that's all we need to know. Are you going to say it here at the end? See you next year, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for watching. <laughs>